Head over to miniaturemarket.com where they have thousands of board games at discounted prices and you can sign up for product alerts. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. You're about to see my Allegro one minute overview and final thoughts. This is designed to see if this game warrants more of your time. If it does, just keep watching because then you'll see my full intro overview and final thoughts. However, if you don't want to be spoiled anything and you want to skip right to the full review, use the time index below in YouTube. Over the course of the game, you're going to be building up Rome with lots of land and buildings. Turns are simple, you're either going to be paying silver for different plots of land, or maybe building plots of land and putting buildings on there. Commercial buildings will be giving you points at the end of each of the three rounds and coins. Residential buildings will move you up a population tracker, which will be worth big points at the end of each round. And civic buildings help you score points with adjacent buildings, yours or other players. Two points for every coin. One, two, two points at the end of every round now, but you'll build around this as well. And it doesn't matter whose buildings they are, so there's a lot of interaction. Or you might be simply taking income to afford some of these plots of land. That's it. Three choices with tons of depth. And by the end of the game, you have a beautifully looking city. With the Emperor Pledges, plenty of expansions, like monuments that make different buildings come out each game, or different objectives that are secret or public, or maybe special abilities, and even a cooperative mode. Foundations of Rome is the best game I've played all year. Off the charts table presence in a 20 pound box. Emerson the designer is the master of elegance. Just three choices, but tons of depth. You're fighting on the population track with a super interesting scoring. You're setting yourself up to set your, you set up your own engine, but you're also dealing with what other players are doing. Tons of interaction. It's like Acquire, Suburbia, and Century Spice Road all mixed together in a box. Unlimited replayability with randomized cards and player interaction. And the expansions unlock even more depth. There's some negatives and one of the rules was written very strange. It's a really important one. The monument colors in the expansions don't really match what building kinds they are. Uh, it's kind of tough to put the monuments away sometimes and the game is expensive. I'd love to see a more a smaller production for a 50 or $60 game that most people could afford. The game is not overproduced because the production quality matches the game quality and a four player game does last two hours if you're playing with a negotiation. Fantastic game of the year so far for me. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Today we're gonna to be building up the foundations of Rome by building plots of land, building buildings like residential and commercial and civic buildings, and we're trying to have the most points in the end. Today we're taking a look at Foundations of Rome, this humongous giant 20 pound box of goodness from Arcane Wonders that was a Kickstarter designed by Emerson Matsuchi. Let me show you how it's played, I'll see you on the other side. In Foundations of Rome, each player has their own tray with these beautiful, humongous buildings that you're gonna be placing out on the board. And these trays come just like this. It's really easy to set up. You just put it in front of you, you take the top off, and you start going. Let me show you what all these look stacked up in the box. Now let me show you what comes in this ginormous box. As we lift it up, there's some great trays. You're gonna see all of the player trays and such in there. So you've got, this has the fifth player expansion. So we get the five player trays. We have the expansion of the monuments trays, all the boards and cards and everything, rules all go in this nice thing. It is awesome, 20 pounds of goodness. Now here's the board with all the empty plots of land of Rome. And this is the side of the board you'll play with three, four or five players if you have that expansion. With five players, it'll be as big as this entire board. Four players, it only goes out to purple. Three players, it only goes out to blue. And two players, it plays just in that grid right there. And if you're just playing two or three players, you can flip the board over so it's just a little bit more compact and you have more nice artwork around the edge. I've got a two player game set up here. And at the beginning of the game, each player's gonna get six plots of land, either randomly or you can draft the cards. And they basically just tell you where they are. Now the game is played over three rounds known as eras. And there's only three things you can do on your turn. One of them is buy a deed. And if you want this spot, you pay the coins that are just above it like this. Now coins, they come both cardboard and uh, this version has metal. I believe all the Kickstarter versions had metal coins with it. Uh, now, if I want this, again, I would just pay two coins to the bank and I would take this and I would build a plot of land, but these would all slide down and then a new one would come out like that. And you can see they're more expensive as the newer they are. And I would immediately put my plot land because I own that. Now, why would I want to do that? Because you're trying to build up bigger and bigger buildings over the course of the game. So having ones next to each other are, is a good idea. Now, let's say it's Purple's turn. Instead of getting a deed, maybe they build. Now, this one is too big. So they can place any building that's going to fit on this. They would put get those back. 
and then we build it like this. There's three types of buildings. <clears throat> this is a commercial building, and it's going to give you uh, income. And if we look a little closer, not only is it denoted there, but also on their player board. Because as you remove buildings, like we just built the pottery studio, it just reminds us that this is going to be worth one income at certain points. Now, the other thing you could do is so you can either buy a deed and put a lot of land. You can build on some of your land, or you can take income. By default, you just take five coins. But if you've built commercial buildings, you'll get additional coin. This will get me another one. Let's say this one was built. That'll get me two more. So instead of getting five, I'd get eight. So you can build commercial buildings for income. Or instead, maybe you build a building that has to do with population. Like this would raise our population by two. And that's tracked on a board here as well as your points just above this. Now the reason why this is important is because as players are buying these cards, this deck is going to dwindle down. And once all these cards have come out and they've all been bought, that would be the end of the first era. And you're going to score based on your population, and it's a very interesting scoring method in this game. You're going to get as many points, the leader's going to get as many points as where they're at, which is eight. But they're also going to get a bonus if they're in the lead. And that bonus will scale as the game goes on. Four points in the first era, seven, and then ten in the third era. But also, the player behind them is going to get however many points of the population of the person in front of them. So this player is going to get eight points for just having this. This makes it interesting because you only want to beat somebody by a little bit because you're giving up a lot of points to other players. But when you're close, it makes it easier for people to jump over to you. So it's a very heavily contested track. So you might say, why would I even want to build population? Let me just get one and I'll get whatever they get. Yeah, true. But if you give up those three bonus points, that's a lot of points by the end of the game. 21 of them in total. Now, in addition to those population points, you're going to get points for your commercial buildings, and it's shown right on your board. It's very easy because these are out on the board. Three and two, I get five points, but I also get three income as well. Now, there's a third type of building you can place out throughout the game, and these are the ones that are going to get you most of the points throughout the game. Now, remember, the other player placed this building. It was give them a coin. It's a commercial building. But maybe I build this civic building here. This is one point for every coin. So at the end of the round, all your civic point, uh, building is going to score. So this is going to get me a point because not only because I placed this, but because it's next to anyone's building that it interacts with like this. But let's say later on, I fought for this lot and I got it because I paid a lot more for it. You can overbuild as long as you're overbuilding over all uh, a building that's bigger than all the buildings you're building over. So I could basically build over here with this and now I'm getting two points per coin. So now at the end of the round, I'm going to be getting two points. And let's say later on, I build this. And I'm starting to set myself up. So not only am I scoring two points because of this, I'm scoring two points because of this. And you're going to be scoring for what you do and for what others do. So you're building engines and trying to seek opportunities on the board. If someone does something great on the board, you're going to be able to capitalize on it if you can get a lot next to it and put the right building there. And the other buildings do certain things like two points for every single civic building that's adjacent to it. Three points for every adjacent civic building. One point for every any building. One point for every population. So if this was next to this, this building's going to get you six points. If you squeeze it in between these two buildings here, you're going to get ten points if you could figure that out. Uh, the other buildings are going to be one point for every two population, one point for every building. So those are the different ways to score at some of these buildings. So each era, more and more lots are coming out. By the end of the game, all of the lots will have buildings on it, and the game just has this interesting arc as the choices get better and better and better as the game on goes on, but they're exciting even at the beginning. And these are some videos of what it might look like towards the end of the game or even after the game's ended. And whoever has most points at the end is the winner. Now, with the Emperor Pledge, there was a fifth player and a bunch of expansions. One of those expansions is the Monuments. It comes with a full board of all these different monuments, like the, you know, the Colosseum and things like that. And they are huge and beautiful and lots of detail. Now, you'll randomly select three of those plus the number of players, and you would basically do that by cards, because they all have their own cards. You randomly pick the cards and then put the buildings out next to the cards, and they do all sorts of things, and they have different requirements. Like, you must own a size 4 plus building, and this building must be constructed on the edge of the board, but anything that's like next to it that's a coin building, you'll get two points for each of the, each of the coins that's around it. I've made tons of money on this one time. Uh, same with this, it needs to be on the, connected on a lot on the edge of the board, but you're going to get three coins and seven points at the end of each era. Uh, so they do different things. Some of them are civic buildings, some are commercial, some are residential, but they all do all sorts of different things. And since they're different every game and they interact with each other, other in different buildings, it's just going to give variety of play for you. You can also play with objective cards, either secret or public, and they give you different goals for the end of the game. They're all worth eight points. You get one of these if it's public, uh, sorry, private. 
Uh, you get to choose from two of them, but public, you could put uh, some of them up face up and you're fighting for each of those. Like most buildings not adjacent to any of your own buildings or most commercial buildings on the edge of the board, most residential buildings on the edge of the board. Fewest number of deed cards in your pile, meaning that you've, you know, you actually have the least amount of things out there. You can also play with special abilities where you get two of these and you secretly pick them and then you reveal. Like whenever you purchase a deed card, you can pay plus two silver to immediately build on a size of one building on that lot right right away or you get an extra two citizens just at the beginning of the game and you're always gonna have two more than you really have on the board giving you a boost on that population tracker or frugal whenever you purchase a deed card you may pay minus one silver if it's orthogonally adjacent to another lot you own so all sorts of different little abilities everyone will get one of these you can also play with trading and or stealing. With trading, everyone gets these and you can use them to trade. They're like two points, if you will, but you can also trade coins and basically you're gonna be trading them for empty lots that are on the board, similar to like Lords of Vegas where you are you can trade and things like that. It makes the game more interesting with negotiation, but you can also do stealing where if you uh, have buildings or lots, two of them that are adjacent to another player's lot, you can steal it, but what? But what's gonna happen is you give this to another player. You'd lose two points, and you give them four, so it's a six point swing. So it might feel like take that, but you're really giving them a lot of points too by doing that. And there's also an expansion to play in a fully cooperative mode against the game. All right, there's Foundations of Rome. Look, it's not even quite halfway through the year of 2022 yet, and I've played a lot of new games. I've played a lot of really great games. None of them are as great as this so far. This is in the lead for game of the year for me, for sure, uh, and it's, this has that special feeling of game of the year for me. Again, I don't know where it's gonna end up at the end of the year, but it's gonna at least be in the short uh, list and in the conversation for that by the end of the year. It is the best game I've played all year. It's probably the best game I've played in the last couple years, actually. Uh, this game has off the charts table presence. I mean, look at this. You get all these trays and all these buildings looking awesome. Uh, it, it just looks really cool. 20 pound box. It's even heavier by far than like Mechs vs. Minions, which was like my heaviest from a weight standpoint, like pounds, uh, game that I had before this. It's designed by Emerson Matsuchi, who is, by the way, one of the nicest guys I've ever met. But he's also probably one of the most talented game designers out there. He just knows how to create elegant games. I'm calling him the master of elegance, and he brings that into this game. I know that term gets used very often, maybe more than it should, probably too often in this, in this realm of board game reviews, but this game is just so, so, so streamlined and so elegant. You had three choices on your turn. Take income, build a lot of land, or you know, uh, build a building. That's it. But the amount of depth that's in this is huge. I always talk about my depth to complexity ratio. This game is off the charts. Tons and tons and tons of depth, very low complexity. You're fighting on the, popul the, the, the population track. And it has very interesting scoring where like you're gonna score points equal to the player in front of you. But the player who's in the lead is gonna get those bonuses. You don't want someone to run away with all three bonuses. That's just too many points to give them. But how much do you wanna fight? And you're constantly looking what other players are doing and when players overbuild, they might come back, which might give you an opportunity to jump ahead. And it's just, it's so interactive. It changes throughout the game, uh, especially with the overbuilding. It's just such a clever way to, to, to do the scoring and to, and to focus on those residential buildings. I love that you're trying to, you're basically setting yourself up or you're capitalizing on others' buildings. So you might buy a bunch of little ones near you, and you might build this, and then you might build yourself in the corner around there and get some good things, and then start building up your own little engine. But as you saw in the video, most of the time, you're also gonna be, and you're gonna need to, work on other people. Some play, one game, someone played one of those huge monuments that got them like eight points, like every era. And it was huge, but I started building up civic buildings all the way around that that was gonna help me, and I ended up scoring just as many points as they did from that building, even though it was really great. And it, seizing those opportunities and constantly looking at what people are doing, what they're building, what they're overbuilding, where their lots are. And it's like, it's this thing where you're like, ah, I don't wanna build there yet because there's two other people that are gonna build there first. Let me wait and see what they're gonna do there first and then I can capitalize on that with my civic buildings. It's such a clever design. This game feels like a mix of Acquire, which I know firsthand Emerson loves Sid Saxon. Uh, more on that later this year. Uh, but he loves Sig Saxon's designs. This felt like a choir. The grid, the A through whatever letter you're playing with, depending on the player count. The way that, but like in a choir, you just randomly take tiles and you place them on the grid. Here you're like fighting for those because they're coming out and the earlier they come out, 
the sooner they come out, like the, the more they cost. It's just brilliant. It uses that sort of century spice road of the newer cards cost more. It also feels suburbia-ish. And I love suburbia, that city building game where everything adjacent has something to do with other things and you have to you can interact with other players based upon what they build. It feels like Acquire, Suburbia, and Century Spice Road all mixed together. Three games that I absolutely love. The game has unlimited replayability. With the randomized way that the cards come out, the player interaction, the order that players to, to, you know, change to do things in, um, the expansions themselves, oh my gosh. And I know that you might not get the expansions, uh, but they unlock so much more depth. I mean, wow, the monuments. Every game you're having a different slew of buildings and they all have different requirements. And some of them are just gonna be not very useful some games. Some of them, that same one that was not useful in that game, might be extremely useful in the next game if it comes out, just because of what players end up doing, what they build, what they overbuild. It's just brilliant. The, the, the objectives, awesome. I love being able to do private and or public goals. Uh, I like the little special abilities at the beginning. The cards have the little, the, the, the different abilities that you buy instead of the lots. That's probably my least favorite just because it also makes the game longer. But if you're looking for a longer, more epic experience, it works well. And then the co-op version, that's the only part of the expansion I have not played yet. Uh, now, no game is perfect. Uh, there are some things I wish were different in the game. Uh, number one is a very important overbuilding rule was worded very incorrect in the rules. It said that you can build over buildings as long as your building is, is bigger than any of the buildings it's over it's overbuilding. And it used the word any. Meaning if you read that and you have a, a building that's in size three and a building that's size one next to it, you can overbuild with a size two and take those out. That's, and I talked to Emerson about this. That's not what the intention was. The intention was it has to be bigger than all of the buildings. So instead of any, it should have said all. And that's a pretty big change because I play, the first time I played the game, I played it with any, as the rules say. And after talking with Emerson, he's like, no, that's not it. So I played it the other way. I actually liked the way that the rule book says better, even though it's wrong. Uh, I felt like it gave us more flexibility. I felt like, oh, someone's really capitalizing on this building. I'll put a one building next to it, then I'll overbuild and get rid of it. You're wasting turns to do that, right? And But uh, anyway, I play with the real rules now. I like the other way actually better, but the little negative there, if you're, if, you're, if you're playing this game, you have to be able to, you have to be bigger than every building you're overbuilding. Mess up in the rules there. Uh, some monuments, this is a big one too, and, I, and I've seen some forum posts about this. The monument buildings, the color of the actual buildings isn't always what that building is. So if it looks like a civic building color, it might not be a civic building. It might be a residential building for say. And it's really confusing and I get why they did it because they wanted that building to like trigger in your brain. Oh, this thing has some very specific scoring that's gonna happen differently than other buildings. But then when you're building around it, sometimes you wanna build around residential buildings for certain areas. And that building might be residential, but it doesn't look like residential. I would have rather have seen it the exact opposite way. Always make the building the color that it actually is, whether it's a monument or not. Because if it's your building and it's a monument, it's a pretty special building. You have the card right in front of you. You'll remember to score it. I would have wished that they did it the other way, but I guess through play testing, more people felt the other way was right. I wish it was the other way. Uh, I, uh, putting the monuments away. Sometimes the monuments uh, in, the, in the tray, they have to go perfectly in the same way to make the tray fit on top. And sometimes one building will be there and it will look like it's the right way, but no, you just have to flip it the other way. And it's like just a straight piece. And it's actually like opposite of what the other pieces look like. S some of the, the way, rhyme or reason that they put some of those pieces didn't make any sense to me. Again, minor quibble here. The game's expensive. After playing this, there weren't very many copies left. In fact, I had to beg the publisher just to sell me one. I bought the most expensive version, the Sundrop miniatures version with the wash. Um, and post Kickstarter, this is just recently after playing the version that I have, I'm like, I wanna buy the, the, the version with the wash minis. I mean, to buy it now with shipping is like $290. It's the most I've spent on any board game ever, but I love this game. So the game is expensive. I think it's like uh, 220-ish for the base game, uh, somewhere around there. It's expensive, but if you play it and you love it, for me, it's gonna be worth it because it's gonna be one of my favorite games of all time for sure. Um, I'd love to, and because of that, I'd love to see a cardboard only version in sort of mass market stores. Uh, so take all these buildings out, just make them cardboard like the co-op expansion looks like. I'd love to see them. I know that they're thinking about doing this, but it hasn't been announced yet whether they're doing it or not. I really hope that they bring this into Targets and Barnes and Nobles with a stripped down version where it's just the gameplay because the gameplay is so good. And that brings me to the last thing. A lot of people are like, ah, oh, this game's overproduced. Well, what does overproduced mean? If the game is amazing, 
and the and the and the, pro the production matches the quality of the game regardless of how not heavy the game is who cares the game's amazing and the product the production of this and the quality of production matches the quality of the game so i don't think it's overproduced plus everyone's like oh it's a short easy game you know what two players even if you know what you're doing will take about 50 minutes five zero four player game if you're playing with the negotiation aspect by the way i forgot to mention this love the negotiation and stealing aspect of the of the of the expansions it makes it feel like lords of vegas where you can negotiate for lots of land and work together anyway awesome part of the expansion but in, in this game here if, if 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 someone thinks it's overproduced and they think it's not long enough four players with the negotiation and table talk hey don't let them do this over here you better stop them over here two hours is what you're looking at for a, a four player game that's not a short game and so again i don't think it's overproduced at all uh, but I would like to see a, a, a more, a, a less expensive version so that I could play this with other people that aren't into games and go, well, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's an affordable version without all these crazy buildings and they would like it, I'm sure, or love it. So overall, best game of the year so far for me. I absolutely love this game. So obviously it's getting a saxophone serenade. Let's hit it. <laughs> Game Toppers not only transforms your existing table to a high quality gaming solution, they now offer full leg kits and dining cover solutions for the full table application. Paired with their amazing thematic premium stitch edge mats from noted board game artists like Vincent Dutre, collapsible cup holders, and really cool accessories, it's a complete system that upgrades every game you play. Go to GameToppersLLC.com or click the link below to late pledge for their latest Game Topper 3.5 Kickstarter campaign.